This presentation is for whoever wishes to see it. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He does not have any form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should. He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. This presentation is the cross of Jesus Christ, the very heart of the matter. Events of the cross include when Jesus was scourged, when he was mocked, when he wore the crown of thorns, when he was nailed to the cross, when the soldiers gambled for his clothes, the sign on the cross with the accusation, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The thieves that were crucified alongside of him. After his death, his side pierced with a spear. Also upon his death, the curtain of the temple in Jerusalem that was torn from top to bottom. And also, his resurrection, bodily resurrection, from the tomb. Preparation for the cross. So Pontius Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus, after he had scourged him, to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed Jesus with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head, and began to salute him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spit on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they mocked him, they took the purple off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out. To crucify him. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And the point here is that wine mingled with myrrh was a type of painkiller, and Jesus had intended to endure the full intensity of the pain that he was going through. When they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. It was about nine o'clock in the morning. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, The King of the Jews. With them they also crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and the other on his left. And those who passed by blasphemed Jesus, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, Save yourself, and come down from the cross. Likewise the chief priests also, mocking among themselves, with the scribes said, He saved others, 
himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. But they lied, they wouldn't have believed him anyway. Yet Jesus did not come down from the cross, did he? And he would not come down either. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So it was from about noon till 3 p.m. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And this means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus, after upon the cross, said, I thirst. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine or vinegar and offered it to him to drink. So when Jesus had received that sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. So when the centurion, who stood opposite Jesus, saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. And then, on the third day, Jesus was raised from the dead and left the tomb empty. So we have all of these different events that surround the cross of Jesus Christ. And the one that I will zero in on is the time period from noon until 3 p.m. That's when noontime was turned into darkness. This is when Jesus was on the cross and what was going on at that time. What was going on? He was taking our sins upon himself. In 2 Corinthians it reads, For he that is God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. And also in 1 Peter, Who himself, that's Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So what is sin? One way of looking at sin, it is alienation. It's from God, from others around us, even from our own selves. Another definition of sin is the big I, where a person thinks it's all about me. Another definition, sin is anything that diminishes the life God intends for us to have. And sin, in a more precise term, is missing the mark. Types of sin include conceit, being high and mighty and looking down your, on your nose at everyone else. Unbelief, that's deliberately making God out to be the liar and trying to prove him to be the one who's so false while you yourself are more right than him. Ignoring God as if his presence and what he has to say doesn't matter. Idolatry. That's replacing God with a God of your own making, or try to change God into some person you want him to be, which he never will become. Blasphemy, that is slander against God. Also gossip, gossiping and whispering secrets to willfully injure other people. Uh, addiction. Abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, also theft, another type of sin, and murder, of course, killing somebody when you think you have 
the right to do so for some little insult. And Jesus took all of these, the sins of the entire world, from Adam all the way to the very end of the age, upon himself. Only God Almighty in the flesh, the Son of God, could do this. So with sin in himself, he also took upon himself the curse. God the Father never cursed Jesus. God cursed sin, and Jesus took this curse upon himself. Galatians had said he was made a curse for us. And now, at three o'clock, when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What did he experience? He experienced God's righteous anger against all that evil. And this is when Jesus truly died. It's when he experienced that separation, that heartbreak, that divorce from the Father and from the Holy Spirit, that condemnation, the righteous condemnation of God against sin, but also condemnation of others toward God. As it says in Romans and in, in the psalm, the reproaches of those who reproached you, that's God, fell upon me. That is Jesus. When all that was done, he cried out, it is finished. Like the runner completing his or her race. Here's an interesting note about the wrath of God. With Elijah at Mark Calm Mount Carmel, when he challenged the false prophets of Baal, <clears throat> he called for fire from God out of heaven upon the sacrifice. And here's what happened. The fire of the Lord consumed the burnt sacrifice, not only that, but also the wood, and the stones, and the dust, he looked up the water that was in the trench. It was all consumed. However, when the fire of God was poured upon the perfect and true sacrifice, Jesus Christ, he endured to say, it is finished. Here's a note. Our sins could never corrupt Jesus. They could not change him to being from who he, in a sense, is and was and always will be the sense of who he is from eternity, he remains the same, full of grace and truth. The point is this, Jesus has effectively exhaust, exhausted all of God's wrath against our sins. So now the justice of God is for us and demands our complete forgiveness of all sins, if we will have it. So why, why would Jesus Christ do this? Consider, <clears throat> the prophet Ezekiel writes, and these are God's words, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And here's some people that are perceived as being very wicked concerning Jesus Christ, Isaiah, the prophet, writes, It pleased the Lord to bruise him when he has put him to grief, when you make his soul an offering for sin. Interesting that Jesus said, What prophet does a man, if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Yet Jesus' own soul was made a sacrifice for the whole world. Continuing on, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's Jesus Christ, our sin bearer. The whole point concerning Jesus, the only death that is the separation from himself that God took pleasure in was the death of Jesus Christ. 
He knew that this would ensure our salvation. He also knew that sin could not keep its hold and reign over Jesus Christ. It was not possible. So why? Well, the answer is found in the nature of God. In 1 John, the Apostle John records simply, God is love. That is agape love. That is the type of love where someone would give of himself for another, even when it's for that, even when it's to that person who's giving, even when it's to his, his or her own hurt. That's what real agape type of love is, and that describes who our God truly is. Also reveals in what the nature of why God made us. We have been created for God Himself. We have been created for someone who is greater than we are. We have been created for God's love, His agape love. And we have been created to be loved by God. Apostle John wrote, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the payment for our sins. We have been created for a sacred, holy, love relationship with God, a communion, communion type of relationship. As Apostle John wrote, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. It is like a fish that abides in the water, and the water abides in the fish. But the fish always remains a distinct being from the water. We've also been created to dwell with God throughout eternity. In Revelation it writes, speaking of a future time, Behold, the tabernacle of God, that's the tent of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. We have been created to love God in response to his love toward us. The Apostle John wrote, We love him, that's God, because he first loved us. And we've been created to love one another. The Apostle John also wrote, Beloved, let us love one another. Another reason, it's the nature of what God wanted to show, wanted to reveal concerning himself to his whole creation. That his faith in his own son Jesus was vindicated because Jesus finished the work and he obtained the victory against sin, death, hell, damnation, judgment, and wrath. As the author of Hebrews wrote, when he, that's Jesus, had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty, that's God the Father, on high. Another thing God wanted to show was his rich favor toward us. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, that in the ages to come, he, that's God, might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the grace expressed towards us also it goes toward his angels as well. God also wanted to show the steadfastness of his love toward us. As Paul wrote to the Romans, If God is for us, who can be against us? And he also continues to write saying, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God and his love toward us in Christ for all of those who are in Christ and believe in him. So what's the point? Jesus, who is the beloved God the Son, preferred to take our sins and hell upon himself at the cross 
rather than to allow us to end up there due to our sins in doing so, Jesus Christ proved the intensity of God's love toward us. So why? In essence, for our complete and permanent reconciliation with God. So some encouraging words as we move on into the heart of the cross of Christ. Writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh. So let's go through the veil. And having a high priest, that's Jesus, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. So let us draw near. Let us therefore come boldly to that throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's cast our, our care upon him, that is God, and Christ, for he cares for us. This is what we were like when we first encountered Jesus. And these, these were what we were on our way to becoming when we first encountered Jesus. As those who were, in a sense, his enemies and had sinned against him. Yet towards us is, fear not, for I am with you. He was compassionate toward the woman caught in adultery, and he was compassionate toward the man who would nail him to the cross. And what's the point? For complete reconciliation. Here's an interesting note. In Revelation, Jesus identified himself as being the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. That Alpha is the first letter of the Greek. Omega is the last letter of the Greek. Corresponding to Hebrew, you have Aleph as the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and Tav as the last letter. And in the original scriptures, you have Aleph Tav that are that are in the original Hebrew writings that have not been translated into English. That was a mystery to them, but of course it, to us it points to Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. So again, Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And also, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. However, if we go to even to the ancient pictograph views of Aleph and Tav, Aleph was, was used to designate God or ox or strength or leader. And of course, Tav always marked was a covenant mark or sign, looked like a cross. So, if we put them together, what do we have? We have God on the cross. And Isaiah writes the, he, well, prophet Isaiah wrote this, words of God, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. It's Christ on the cross, basically saying this. Here's another interesting tidbit. <clears throat> Using the ancient pictograph representation of the Hebrew word that was translated as in the beginning in our English Bibles, the first letter is bet, meaning a house or tent, then resh, which is the first or highest persons, <clears throat> then aleph, which is a strength or God, and Shin is to consume and destroy. Yad is a uh, hands and works, or is, and Tav is the covenant and mark. Put them all together, with Bet, with a 
highest person of the house, you have the Son of God destroyed the works of our hands, that is the sinful works of our hands, on the cross. It is as if God was looking far into the future before he created anything, and he said this. And this is not in the scripture, but this is just some insights that a person can derive from the scriptures. So it says if he was looking into the future and saying, my people whom I love are going to get into trouble, into sin. Sin is too much for them. They cannot overcome it. Also, a murderer will arise to stalk them, seeking to kill them. I will appoint foolish ones to build according to my design, that is, construct the cross. There I will send my salvation. That's Jesus Christ. My salvation will win for bringing us out of sin to death, to bringing us to righteousness in life. My salvation, that's Jesus Christ, is already won. And whom did he do this for? Did this for you, and 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 you. He did it for all of us, especially of those of us who would believe. So let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus despised the embarrassment of the cross. It says if that Jesus said, you think that this cross really succeeded in its humiliation against me? I endured this to save the people I love. It has been my honor. Jesus Christ has taken this instrument of humiliation and he has transformed it into the exclamation point of his agape love toward us and for us. So therefore, in the light of this, we want his work on the cross to mean something in our lives. So it is for Jesus' sake that we wish to be with him in heaven. And this is the heart of the matter of the cross of Christ.